Okay, so first of all, just uh, for listeners who may not be familiar with you, um, I'd like you to describe who you are, what you do, um, the way you'd like to be described. Okay, um, well, I'm a filmmaker uh, that makes usually strange and supernatural films. I... I know technically, I guess I'm a horror filmmaker, but my films are not horrific so much as as bizarre and steeped in the supernatural. So that's really my predilection. And uh, I've been making films since my early 20s and worked in the film industry in Montreal to, to pay the bills, so to speak. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much it. I'm okay. from Montreal. And okay. my, my born and raised in Montreal, English and French speaking. My father was American and my mom's from France. So I'm a real, I'm a real mutt. <laughs> okay. Um, and then on top of your filmmaking, you've uh, been involved in climate action, right? Right. Oh, yeah. For... <laughs> 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 yeah. I mean, that was very recent. So in 2018, um, I read the secretary general of the UN's sort of call for action for climate change and the ecological emergency. And I hadn't really been aware of the gravity of the situation before. I sort of knew vaguely there was a problem. And so that really prompted me to act. And so I dove deep into climate activism and I've been doing a bunch of stuff um, until recently. And then now I'm in Morocco because I spend a part of the year here with my husband okay. and um so that's been on hold because i can't really do much out here N nor would i being political here is much more dangerous than in canada so for our our well-being i'm i'm staying put okay i want to talk a little bit of your history of action here in canada um was um cinema for the climate was that where you started um bringing in the climate action or were you doing it before that no i started really in 2018 um i went to a march in montreal and the speakers at the end were talking about extinction rebellion and i was like oh my god this is like what needs to be happening not i wouldn't say naively but in a way i got really fired up and i and I had never really done any activism before. So I started the Montreal chapter with two other guys and we like dove right in and gave classes. And I mean, not that I do anything really, but gave presentations, I should say. And then started doing actions probably six months after. Um, so I was with XR for about another year. And then the pandemic hit and everything sort of fell apart. And then myself and another activist who I'd met through Extinction Rebellion started another group called the Ministry of the New Normal, a, a female affinity group. And that was much more, much closer to what I do. So we had characters, we had like a narrative, we did little videos, we did actions as our characters. So we did that for two years. And then I my life really changed when I started to go to Morocco more. And so my, the group sort of, well, disbanded informally. We weren't like, we're done. We we're just like, well, I'm one of the leaders. I'm not here. The other women all had different priorities at that point in their lives. So, okay. so yeah, so that's, and cinema for the climate. I mean, to be honest, it's not really that active it was more of me being like we need to do something in cinema and trying to recruit friends to help and then realizing it's too much effort for very little return so I, it's still on my website maybe i should take it off okay but it's not but it's not because in a way it gives people resources it's sort of also linked i i was i mean i'm still a member of the dgc's the director's guild of canada's climate action committee but now that I'm in Morocco, I can't participate. The meetings are too late in the day. Um, and so when I'm in Canada, I participate. And 
I was I, I was on that committee since I think the fall of 2020. Um, and so I ended up like coming up with tips for filmmakers and putting that on on my website. And that's sort of the extent of what that is right okay. now. Okay. So what do uh what do those tips look like? Like what are changes are you hoping to see or is on the Directors Guild uh sustainability and climate action committee um hoping to see with these tips or um what does that look like on well uh, they really want to reduce the the carbon footprint of productions productions are extremely carbon intensive film film and tv productions so it's and because film is always in like an urgency mode it's really hard for people to stop and sort of plan um initiatives to reduce their carbon footprint but because it's a lot of studios have started to do it and, and really implementing it in their their practices and what they expect from service productions i think it's been trickling down to canada um i mean it's like every everything from changing your fleet to EVs or reducing the the size of the cars used to using um, tie-ins instead of diesel generators, uh, making sure that to reduce food waste because that, that's a big producer of I think methane in the dumps, um, reducing paper, you know, reducing flights. So basically reducing inefficiency and and uh, also in the art department making sure that instead of throwing away sets and props and that everything is recycled and repurposed and goes back into the chain the consumption chain so it's really a different way to, to see a production and the dgc wants people to really start thinking about it from the beginning so even before going into production like as you get the money you, you sit down with all the heads of departments and it's usually a someone higher up, like a producer or director who's going to be the driving force and say, well, this is really important to me and this is what each department should be looking into um, to reduce their carbon and waste footprint. So, I mean, it's it's hard from what I understand, but they're, they keep plugging away. They have a really good website and I think they are making some headway. I know in Vancouver, they're pretty advanced. Quebec, not so much. But um, but it's with filmmakers who aren't going to decide to to take that into account from the beginning, like from the conception of the production setup, basically. Okay. If, someone, if no one leads the way, then the departments are not necessarily going to do it. Or if one department does it, you know, that's not really enough. Or if like a coordinator wants to do it, but no one else does, and he or she are by themselves trying to to force people to change and they don't really have the power to so you've worked on big ones like um as a production or like in as a crew member but on your films they might be a little smaller um but has there been a big change in the way you like things work on your sets since you started or have... well to be honest like slacks was made just as i was sort of awakening to this crucial okay. need and so no we didn't really do much on slacks because we shot slacks in february 2019 and i didn't have time to i actually didn't know as much about uh, production sustainability as i did as i do now um and i haven't shot another film since so but but hopefully knock on wood um the next one then yeah I'll, I'll talk to the producers and i'll make sure that that's part of our game plan that okay. we then, you know gather all the the up-to-date information and and uh, disseminate it and have meetings and and make sure that everyone's on board even when they're hired it's like you can make sure that when people are hired you tell them that this is one of your goals and if they're on board great and if they're not then they might not be the best person but it's hard in film because you want to pick the best craftsperson and then hope 
but they're also on board with the, your sustainability goals. It's not always the case, but I haven't I haven't tried yet. So hopefully, hopefully okay. they'll all align. And it does look like you have a few things on the horizon, like a few series. If you if website's up to date, um, potentially coming along and. Um, it's in development, so it's hard to say, you know, like yeah. I can, I have so much in development, but I've, there's a lot of projects that I had, I worked on very hard that never got made. So I'm always a bit hesitant to be like, oh, this is going to be the next one. Cause then I'm like, so sure. And then it's like, no, actually this doesn't work. But yeah, I'm developing, I have three TV shows and then another two features at really various stages of development. And I would say two of those TV shows have a environmental or climate action perspective, but there are, you know, one is su a supernatural mystery and one is like a violent satirical comedy. Okay. <laughs> like, it's, not, it's not a horror. There's no supernatural yeah. elements, but it's definitely like bloody and over the top. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so, um, Extinction Rebellion. Well, we'll start there. Um, could you um, just talk a little bit more about what that is and what your participation in that was? Yeah, I mean, so Extinction Rebellion, also known as XR, came out of the UK. And it's a civil, nonviolent civil disobedience movement. So it adopts the the model of disruption, nonviolent disruption of society in order to get governments, usually governments or corporations to react to the climate emergency. So this was done a lot in the civil rights movement and the anti-nuclear movement, um, the suffragette movement. So it has a long history of working. Um, and XR in the UK was quite active for about two years. And then obviously the pandemic sort of smashed it. And now from what I understand, they're still active, but um, not as disruptive. So the idea of disruption is to sort of force the issue into society. So you do disruptive actions and then you get press coverage and then people go, oh my God, there's a climate emergency. Um, but to be honest, like I'm really sad to say that even though that has helped because it, it's helped galvanize people's uh, realization of the climate emergency, it hasn't done much to move governments, certainly not corporations. Um, I think we're in a much different society now than we were in the 60s. Not to say that civil disobedience doesn't work. I think it does work at certain certain points, like the the Ferry Creek blockades. You know, it works for very very specific um, problems, but so, something so huge as what is causing the climate and ecological breakdown, which is our modern way of life, <laughs> it's sort of hard to stop it by doing by blocking society unless everyone like unless it's a huge number of people they say three percent which doesn't seem like much but is is quite big of people block society block the functioning of society until government takes action and when i realized the extent of the climate emergency and i was like oh my god of course this is going to work people just need to know and they will come out of the street and get arrested and that wasn't the case people were like yeah i know it's a problem you know, but whatever, what are we going to do about it? And I was like, well, you could join us, you know? And they're like, well, I don't know. I don't want to get a police record. I want to go to Cuba. This Like, I know I'm, I'm sounding like a bitch, but that's basically what, what I was said to me a lot. And, um, and it was very discouraging because like, I can see the effects of climate change in Morocco and it's people who've done very little to cause this are suffering the most, you know, like including my husband and his family, mm -hmm. his, who were nomads and a lot of them had to give up their nomadic lifestyle because of the drought in Morocco. 
So I don't know, to be honest, right now I'm like, I'm in Morocco, la la la. <laughs> I don't know what to do. Maybe I'll just make crazy films with that message. And, yep. you know, maybe diving into activism was helpful to sort of open up my eyes and give me a new perspective. But I don't know, coming back to Montreal, what I'll do. Because I, I don't think that movement is really active anymore that much. And Quebec is a very passive society, so people don't get mad really that much. They're like, you know, don't make trouble. <laughs> like, they're not like France, where you know you move a comma in the constitution, and they're like up in arms, and everything's blocked for for weeks and weeks, which is both good and bad, I guess. But the it's not a funny society. Thing about you saying society. that is where I am in Ontario. We talk about Quebec like, whoa, those people get mad. We don't get mad. <laughs> Oh my God. <laughs> I guess it's always compare and despair, right? But yeah. I mean, we were a small group, but what we found was that it was really people who almost were outside normal society. Maybe that's how it is everywhere, but who took on, who got so mad that they were willing to do something about it. But like everyday people, like in France, like the Gilets Jaunes, they really disrupted society and that was from every angle but in Quebec unless I mean it's it's good that we make noise but we're very few um like the rest of society they'll come out for protests and stuff for like peaceful marches but they won't do anything that that disruptive okay and it's just a perception I in guess. this and in, in perceptions um Words like uh, emergency, they get thrown around and then it seems they get um, absorbed or whatever. And everyone will, even the corporations who are perpetuating this will use the word emergency, but they, they won't, you know, change their actions, their own actions to um, show that it is an emergency and it is something that people should be treating like their house is on fire um so yeah the the way that those things get absorbed i i guess what i'm saying is it seems like those can be really frustrating to people who want to make a difference and how do you feel about that when well, I'm not surprised. Like corporate corporations are pretty much evil monsters. Like um, I'm, I've always, even though I wasn't a climate activist ever since I was quite young, I've been bizarrely aware of corporate evil. Like I have no idea why I had, my parents were, have never been activists and were, well, that's not true. I guess my father went to the Peace Corps to avoid Vietnam. So there was sort of like a rebellious streak in the family, but they certainly weren't too aware of or concerned by corporate malfeasance. Um, yeah, I'm not surprised because if they co-opt it, then it doesn't feel like an emergency anymore. It's the best way really to to make it less of an emergency if they adopt it in their, their lingo, like carbon neutral. Now everything is carbon neutral, but that means nothing. That means absolutely nothing. It means that they vow to plant trees, who cares? <laughs> like wow you know you keep making coke bottles but you plant trees and the coke bottles end up in the ocean and you use petrochemicals to make that like it's so bullshit i mean that's what slacks is about yeah yeah it's dude. frustrating but it's not it's i'm not surprised I, I guess in a way it's not frustrating because i'm not surprised what's frustrating for me is people's inaction people who don't really think this is their problem and who just continue with their lives as if it was business as usual, you know, that something that affects us all and is going to affect us all very much sooner than we think. I mean, is it, like last summer was a nightmare with all those fires. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's only going to get worse. Like, I don't understand what people don't understand. Yeah. <laughs> it, and I mean, I look out school. my window and the weather a winter around where I am has completely changed and mm. it, it 
it's not like we have one winter out of that's a little different than the other ones and then it goes back to um how it was before it, it's progressively been changing and it, now we're getting we used to never get you know as much rain in january and february as we're getting now it used to all be snowstorms and um the the climate around here is <laughs> i don't know what to say it's fucked, fucked. up yeah yeah um it's it's totally different than uh it, it was years ago when i was growing up it, it's and we can see that and we talk about that but it seems people talk about it but are not prepared to do anything more than talk about it a lot of the time it's it's not uh it's not something that's going to change if if we're no. not um willing to do more than talk about it um no yeah so and what is um can you tell me more about uh the uh sectoral climate arts leadership for the emergency um yeah that was well that it's also something that because i'm in morocco the meetings are too late um and it's also morphed so i sort of lost track of it uh, after i came here that was started by some key figures in the art world and it's basically to try to leverage the power of the um, cultural industry for change so they do a lot of lobbying um they, there's a lot of members like theaters and museums it's more i don't want to say corporate but it's it's um you know it's established art organizations who are rallying together to push for change um in the government in in the arts funding they want to the government to fund arts that addresses the climate emergency um so it's a real i would say sh they're pushing for like a shift in perspective and what the arts how the arts can affect people to really come to realize that this is an emergency i know talking about an emergency it's ridiculous because it's like if this was an emergency we'd be doing something about it but um yeah my friend anthony garofelis Auger, who i co-founded xr with was one of the co-founders i don't know if he was a co-founder but he was definitely one of the early coordinators of scale so he got me on board but like, like at first it was trying to brainstorm and do actions and stuff but now i'm not sure what they're doing i feel like being out here i've really like stepped out but it's it's at least to say it's it's encouraging that people in the arts who are who you wouldn't think would be necessarily activists they really feel very deeply obviously artists feel deeply that's why we're artists and so they're willing to really re-examine how they create their work and the impact their work has on the environment and climate so that's another part of what scale is is like trying to implement like the dgc basically like how to reduce our carbon footprint by making art different kinds of art okay and there's a lot of stuff going on in the arts there's a huge a huge up swing like groundswell of people who who want to change how the arts are made and what the arts can do to address the climate emergency so yeah it does seem like um in the arts there's always people who are thinking a little more progressively and want to um, be more inclusive want to um tackle many of the social problems that we we have and um it is one industry where maybe even the corporations want to be involved um, that are related to that sector. So yeah, the other thing is your movies. Um, and yes, Heidi is my wife. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, we were, 
watching your movies again and we noticed a theme that might have been totally intentional um in going all the way back to uh graveyard alive which you said uh you told me you, you're getting a 20th anniversary uh, yeah release re-release on blu-ray Woo! <laughs> okay um so the one theme and it may have been totally intentional but we noticed it more because um gaslighting is it's one of those phrases that's in the media all the time now um and the character of goody two shoes who it, we find hard to like but um <laughs> We we were very sympathetic because all throughout the movie, she ends up being told, you know, she's hallucinating, she's paranoid or um, crazy. So mm -hmm. we we viewed it with that um, eye on uh, modern mm -hmm. media. And was that something you were thinking about when you were writing? it way back then or um, i didn't even know the term gaslighting i mean i just know that that's how women have been treated for centuries um so it just came out naturally it's like she's trying to tell the truth or, or bring out some form of truth and she's just being told she's crazy so to me it was just like business as usual for for the ladies <laughs> which is sort of sad but no it's interesting that you picked that up because i think in go in the wilderness that theme is definitely there as well mm -hmm. and slacks too of course yeah yeah okay yeah we got through uh graveyard alive and go in the wilderness last night and we're gonna rewatch slacks probably <laughs> tomorrow night after work or something but um oh a mini elsa kevar festival i love it yeah yeah, we love it too. And we're excited, yeah. hoping, hoping that some of those uh films you have or series, we'd love to see a series or two. Um hoping some of those things you have in development get picked up and go through. And two. so years I've been working on some of these these suckers for like 20. One was 20 years. Oh. One is like 10 years and one is pretty recent, but then another is about five or six years. Or I guess including another draft, it's almost 10 years. I take a long time. Well, Grim Here Life was done very fast, but the other ones were were not. So it takes it takes a while, but I hope so. I hope especially <laughs> the environmental ones get made because I think those are really relevant. So those those are the ones that I most like to get made. Yeah, and um I guess I kind of heard a connection there. When you're um, working on getting uh, a film or a series made, it seems like things go slow and people may not always pick up on what you want to be putting out there. Um, so is is that something that kind of, already receiving that sort of uh, treatment when you're trying to get your work out there, is that something you're, that you can connect to the way that people react to climate action or um, because there's a, maybe a similarity of people not always picking up what you're putting down right away or um i'm not it's interesting question i'm not sure it's the same okay. it comes from the same place i think for me you know until before i made slacks people didn't really take me seriously but i think partly it was because i was a woman because there was a lot of there was a lot up till you know five years ago i would say uh, there was still not a lot of women directors. Women weren't taken seriously. There's definitely unconscious bias in uh, financing. But that's so, and also in Quebec, 
no one made genre films. I was an anglophone. So I sort of had all the decks stacked <laughs> against me. Um, but it took me a while to realize. I just thought, oh, I was not good enough, you know, like a lot of women do. But then I, I got introduced to some feminist writings by a really great group of women called Realisatrice Equitable. So that really helped me be like, no, it's not my fault. It's just, yeah, like you said, gaslighting, right? It's like, oh, I mean, I was told so many things like it's in English. We don't really fund English films that much. Or, yeah, but we don't really fund genre films. So I guess I was being, in a way, gaslit. <laughs> but then I, I made slacks and I knew. I was like, if I make slacks, I bet things are going to change. And people definitely take me more seriously now. So I think the stuff that might have been too obscure before, now people are going to pay attention to. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to get made. But at least now I've got like a, a foot in the door and I've got a, I have a lot of great reviews and Slacks did really well. So people are going to actually listen and be like, oh, maybe, you know, she has something to say rather than be like, oh, this is too weird. Or like, we're not sure you're ready for this. Like how many times did I hear that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um... But, but for climate activists, to go back to your question, I think climate activism, it's more that people don't want to change or they don't want to really understand the amplitude of what's going on. Or even if they do, it's too much. I get it. Like they don't want to have to do anything because it's just too much once you really start to think about the magnitude of it. So I think it comes from a different place. But yeah, for sure, it's the the results can be can be similar, similarly frustrating. Okay. Um, we already talked about uh, your films or uh, series in development. Um, do you want to, are they too early? Do you want to go into talking about yeah. them? Or, okay. Yeah, sure. Do you want to? Yeah, sure. I mean, the one that I would say is the most relevant, well, there's two. One that I've been working on for the most for the one of the longest ones I've been working on, and it, I, I would say which is particularly relevant, is called Night, Night of the Pendulum. It's a mini series set in the north of either Quebec or Ontario in the mining industry. So it's about a, a young engineer who is given by seemingly by accident a pendulum that starts to sort of mess with his mind and start to make him see different a different dimension of the world and of nature. Um, and concurrently, there is a young woman in Ontario who starts to bleed from the ears, gets like this terrible ring in her ears and bleeds from the ears and then finds out her mother and her father died. So they both, who live in that small mining town, she moves back for the funeral. And she realizes that her, oh, I don't want to spoil it, but whatever, that let's just say that she and the mining engineer are tied together by an ancient curse. Um, but the curse has to do with how the mine has been able to mine gold for decades and why this mine is seemingly endless. Um, and so it's a definite um, comment on extractivism and just the greed behind um, the destruction of nature and how if people don't do anything about it and change their perspective, it's going to kill them. <laughs> So I like that one because it's like a supernatural mystery and those are my favorite. Then I have one called uh, Global Terror Inc. about a group of young activists who decide instead of just like marching or doing climate actions, decide to basically punish corporate malfeasance or corporate malfeta. I don't know how, how you would say it, like corporate villains who are responsible for the climate and ecological emergency and basically they go out, just go out and torture and kill them <laughs> and they have a, like a, a grand planet it's, it's like slacks in a way so it's a critique on obviously corporations and um, but it's funny it's like humorous and satirical so that one would be a lot of fun and then i have a vampire series that i've been working on with the slacks co-writer patricia gomez latar for like 20 years it used to be a feature and then it didn't quite work and then we turned into a series I don't know what's picked it up yet but I think it would be a lot of fun and then I have a feature film that I'm with the Slacks producers it's a more like a possession like a bizarro possession 
story. I would, it's not a ghost story quite, but it's like a psychological possession story. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so that one's, I'm rewriting that one and hopefully we can, we, we want to apply for financing in the fall. We'll see where that goes. Okay. So you've, it sounds like you've got a lot going on there. Um, <laughs> I do. I always do. <laughs> Maybe too much. <laughs> Um, and any of them hitting like the pre-production, like a uh, uh, kind of stage where it looks like there might be a timeline for a release, or they're no, all no, no, okay. they're all in like super like the vampire one, like we. We don't know what's there's uh, no the, the short answer is no, no. okay <laughs> but they're more advanced some are more advanced than others so some have producers some don't so they're really all at different stages so um and even the scripts are at different stages so okay i, I would i would like that but not right yeah now. <laughs> as a fan we're going when when's the next thing oh, when, nice when, to when's hear. something gonna come up but um yeah take as long as you need because we don't want to rush you and, and... <laughs> i want to rush myself and i find out i can't like it, i just take a long time i always say i'm a pentium 2 processor i just like it just takes me a while to get it right like even if i force it it just it doesn't work it just sort of you know i'll have like a spark and i'll be like yes okay that's how we need to go and then and then it usually goes pretty quickly once i'm like okay we need to do it like this until i hit that that point i'm like and then it's like you've done it but then what do people think who's going to produce it who's going to fund it ah that's still that's okay um so that's uh what's on the horizon for film um and then for as far as activism goes or anything to deal with the uh climate emergency do you have anything going on that way or any way you encourage people to uh to be involved in that well, i don't have anything right now because being in morocco for another I'll, I'll have been here for six months. Like I'm really cut off from the activism world. I'll see what happens when I come back. Like I'll try again, touch with my, my friends and see what's, what's going on. If I can get involved. Um, I don't know how, but yeah, I'll, I'll for sure keep my, my toes in there. And, um, I gave, um, I organized a panel at Fantasia last summer about like what we can do, uh, what filmmakers can do. So maybe I'll do that again. Um, and as far as pe what people can do, I mean, you can get involved in some organization if you, you know, there's so many ways to be involved, like just community gardens is one. It sounds like innocuous, but Growing your own food is very important. Even like supporting local farmers, um, driving less, flying less, um, not eating as much red meat or meat or dairy, um, you know, reducing your consumption, reducing your need for unnecessary goods. You know, our society is really great at like, making us want stuff and then once and then it breaks after five days and then you have to get something new because no one can repair it but being in Morocco has really changed my outlook like people here it, at least where I am not everywhere of course I can't speak to all Moroccans but there's this whole swath of, of population here in this town they, they don't they're not poor necessarily I mean some are poor but you know some are middle class but they just don't have a lot of stuff you know you go to their house and there's almost nothing and I, again, it's not because they're poor, because they'll have a big screen TV and some some have a car and their houses are very big, but they just don't have a lot of stuff. It's not in their mentality. 
or they repair. People still repair things out there, you know, or they just eat what's in season. So, like, my husband is a great one for just repairing things until until you can't repair them anymore. And he repairs them himself. I mean, he's very handy, but not everyone can do that. But just changing our our mentality instead of throwing things out or wanting the latest iPhone because just because it's come out, you know, just wait until your old one is not good anymore and then change it rather than like jumping on this fad. Like fashion is just terrible. I mean, slacks is all about that, but like mm -hmm. overconsumption of fashion. If you go to a mall, if you start to see how, how, how many clothing stores there are in our cities, in the malls, it's ridiculous. It's grotesque. Like just we're used to it. So we go walk in and they're like, oh yeah, it's like 80% clothing stores in the mall. But why? Like, it's nuts. It's really, it's really nutty. So changing, trying to change your outlook about what you really, really need instead of what you want. And credit is so easy, has made it so easy for us. Like in Morocco, I think one of the reasons people don't have a lot of stuff is because it's really hard to get things on credit here a lot of people can't have access to credit so they have no choice they can't buy it but i also think some people just don't because that's not in their culture to to consume which i think is good so, so try to like do like southern rockets and don't buy anything you know but just re, re rethink what you need you know and and just mm -hmm. make your life a bit which is a big change to our culture here in Canada. Like we're we're wasters. Um it's and we've been raised that way. We've we've become used to it. It's so I mean, really looking at other cultures and seeing how we can adapt and okay. Yeah. I mean, we think we're still superior with our technology and, and all that crap. But actually, when you look, when you turn the, change the way you look at things, you know, it's, there's a lot of stuff about our culture that's really grotesque in a way, especially consumption, overconsumption and filling your every waking minute with, with stuff, you know, with information or emails or like, we can't just sit still and just live you know we have to fill ourselves every which way and i think that's very problematic mm -hmm. I, mean, I, could go, I could go on about why i think that is but but i do think it's like it's more a philosophical question in a, in a sense it's not just like oh corporate brainwashing brainwashing it's like a, a loss of of sense of what why we're here and what the point of our life is and so we can mm -hmm. just fill it with stuff and useless information to stop us from thinking okay um <laughs> you know just because i just on a light note call it on a light note but i i do think that's part of the problem well i mean in a way light notes are we if, if things are emergencies we should maybe be moving away from some of the light notes in our lives. Mm. Um, how do you wanted me to say again how special your movies have been for Aww. us? And um, so, Thanks. yeah. Um, so, unless is there anything else you want to get out there to people that you can think of off the top of your head? Mm, I mean. Yeah, that we are in like a critical point in the history of humankind and that it's not a joke, you know, people are suffering and dying because of this. The corporations are brainwashing us to and governments to not think about it. So it's time for people to wake up and take their take stock of, of their lives and how they're contributing to this and what they can do to to change to contribute it in a positive way so yeah and do some you know do research read about stuff 
and inform yourself. And when I started to read, I was like, oh my God, where have I been all this time that I didn't know this shit? Yeah. <laughs> you know? So yeah. it's up to us to inform well, ourselves. Yeah, I know exactly how that feels. Um like I've I've moved in the journalism I do. Um, I've moved away. I was working for um, companies that were tied to the Toronto Star and um, all that. And I realized um, how some of what I was writing was being edited because it um, we didn't want to piss off sponsors or like uh, uh, or advertisers and that sort okay. of thing. So, um, yeah, I really see the way we we set things up in a way to, even when we cover, you know, corporate social responsibility um, from banks and that, and make it look like they're doing great things on one side. And oh, then, they're the worst. Exactly. On the other side, they're donating to the companies that are arresting uh, indigenous protesters or yep. um, they're investing in the oil industry yep. on the other side, but they're planting trees, like you said, mm -hmm. on one side. It's it's crazy. So I, I found myself just moving away from the journalism that mm -hmm. I had been trained to do um, mm -hmm. because it, it's kind of depressing when you're doing one thing and want to see one thing happening and you end up um knowing that you're just doing something that's perpetuating what you're you want to move against it's I think it's that's tough a, it's a good point i mean not everyone can afford to change jobs or change the way they live but i think people do owe it to themselves and to the rest of the world to take stock of what they can do. You know, can you change a job? You know what? One thing you can do, which is pretty simple, but I know it's irritating for a lot of people is to change banks to stop going into one of the top five, especially RBC. RBC is the worst, the worst, the worst. So if you actually want to do something, you change away from RBC and send them a letter, tell them why you're changing. Um, but all the top five, TD, CIBC, BMO, Scotia, they all invest heavily in the oil and gas industry. So going to like a credit union, doing your research, that is that is something. Divesting, if you have investments, divesting from any investments in oil and gas, you know, telling your broker, again, if you have if you're lucky enough to have that, that you don't want like that. I have a small investment in my, I told my broker, I was like, I don't want any of this. And he was like, yeah, but there, I was like, no, I don't care how much money they make. I don't want it. And he was like, all right. You know, so that's, there's so many small things we can do. And I know some people think like small things don't matter. And I used to be someone like, I used to be like that in the heydays of my like activism. I was like, small steps don't matter, but they do. If everyone leaves RBC because they're like, fuck you, then okay, they're not necessarily going to go bankrupt. That's, or it's going to hurt them. Mm -hmm. It's going to send a message. So do it. Come on, you guys change banks. <laughs> okay. Um, so yeah, like, uh, like I said, it's been great to talk to you. So Me too. I thank you very much for taking the time to do this. Me too. You okay. know, it was great. It was nice to, nice to chat. All right. Thanks. Bye. Bye.